here with the Crossroads Podcast and in today's episode I have a little bit of a surprise for you. So I was just finished recording an interview with Fabio Vigi, a professor of critical theory at the University of Cardiff as well as a fellow Italian and I first came across his work last month while I was in France when my father sent me a brilliant essay of his that tied together the two fundamental elements necessary to understand the truth behind this global pandemic response. So the financial picture, BlackRock, going direct, central banks, and all the things I've kind of been discussing over the last couple of episodes on the podcast, as well as the socioeconomic picture. So the crisis of capitalism, the transformation of society, and the mechanisms necessary to keep people in check while the paradigm shift essentially takes place. So in our discussion, we talked about these two core elements, which were kind of our starting points, but we also went further. We talked about the role and complicity in many ways of the modern left towards what's happening. We talked about the universities and academia. And of course, we talked about his position as a university professor in the context of these rapidly coming changes, which are increasingly affecting us personally. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Let me know what you think. Be sure to like and share the episode with at least one person. Also leave a rating on the podcast wherever you're listening, as that's always helpful. But yeah, without further ado, here is my discussion with Professor Fabio Vigi. I hope you enjoy. It's all fine, right? Are we communicating? Oh, yeah. It yeah, looks like we brilliant. are. How are you? Buongiorno, just, uh, Professore. Buongiorno. Ciao, Nico. Chiamo me. Just call me Fabio. Don't Fabio, bother yeah. me all the rest. Yeah, Fabio. I don't need all the rest. How are you? How are you? First of all, I'm okay. Yeah, not too bad. Um, I've got a cat here who's who's potentially interfering, so yeah. I need either to let him go out or. But then, if he's out, he will moan. <laughs> it's okay for now. Let's wait until he interferes. I also have a cat, but I closed my door. Although he yeah, can, my okay. cat can open doors, though, so we never <laughs> know what, what could happen. So I was curious. How was your return from Italy? All all smooth or? It was okay, actually. Yeah, it was. It was interesting. Um, we were not really checked much, you know. Mm. The, there wasn't much in terms of um, checking documents. We, we had to do it all, the tests and everything, but um, they didn't seem to care too much. I think it's um, it's more like a prevention exercise, you know, yeah. to prevent you from from from, tra- from traveling. Uh, yeah, once yeah. you're actually traveling and you're moving around, it's more or less okay because you know, you decided to do it and you're, you're in there already. But uh, I think it's a matter of, of draining, you know, we all will talk about draining the, 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 the money, the circulation of money and making sure that there isn't too much spending, as it were, uh, which will drive inflation up. I think that's my, oh, yeah. my okay. view of it. And it kind of got confirmed a little bit by, um, by the little holiday I took. So, but, you know. Yeah. It's an interesting moment, right? It's the, very the, interesting. We can so, speculate a little about what what is going on. And um, listen, if if you ask me those questions that you you've indicated in your email, we can have a chat about them together, right? We we can we can we can see where it goes. We don't have to necessarily uh, be strict with. No, um, of course not. No, I'm very flexible. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Yeah. So why don't we actually start before getting into the various subject matters? Why don't you give us a little bit of an introduction about who you are and what you do, so that we can uh, get that out of the way, so that people know uh, from what perspectives you're talking about. And I'm I'm um, I'm, an, I'm an academic, so <laughs> we'll talk about academics a little bit later, <laughs> later a little, but I'm I'm one of them. I'm one of the, the so I teach here at Cardiff University. I teach mostly uh, critical theory, film studies. Um, um, and obviously, I have PhD students. Um, so, and I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm interested generally in critical theory and contemporary philosophy. Um, mm-hmm. I've been following Slavoj Žižek, for example, mm-hmm. for quite for quite a while, um, and, and working on a critique of uh, labor uh, from um, you know Marxist perspective. Um, but generally, I would say that I work on critical theory and contemporary philosophy. Okay, how long have we been at Cardiff? About 20 years now. Wow, okay. 20 years is a long, long time, yeah. Wow. All right, so 
actually came across your work for the first time last month. I was in France while I was, while I wrote your essay. My dad, my father sent it to me actually. And he's very happy now I'm interviewing you. Uh, first thing I'll do after is send him the link to the interview because he's looking forward <laughs> to it. But uh, this um, essay was really detailed and I'm mostly gonna be, uh, we're not gonna be strict as we said, but I'm mostly gonna be referring to the English version because it's a bit shorter and a bit more uh, yes. sort of easily digestible. But in this essay, you essentially make the argument that at least according to the official narrative and what we've been told over the past 18 months, this global shutdown of the economy of social interactions has basically been on the grounds of compassion for humanity. There is a virus going around, there's a dangerous virus, people don't have immunity. And until we get that figured out, until we get a vaccine going, we're gonna be stuck in this sort of twilight zone, new normal scenario. But of course, yes. you quickly point out that actually the global capitalist class, whether you want to call it global, global cap or whatever you want to call it, it doesn't really care that much about us. And you set forth to in the first part of your essay to explain the sort of financial picture and you title it Follow the Money. So the first thing I wanted to ask you is what can we learn once we actually do start to follow the money and gain an understanding of the sort of systemic issues of capitalism and the way it was even before COVID really? Yes, um, I, I think, yes. Initially, obviously we, we, we I thought also that the, the, the pandemic was simply a kind of zoonotic event and I kind of then started to follow it um, a little bit more in depth and um, the, kind of the penny dropped for me when I, when I really saw what was going on in the financial markets, um, what had been going on for a while particularly since uh, the autumn of 2019. So a few months before, before COVID erupted. And um, what I saw there was, um, others obviously saw it too, um, uh, it was a connection between, between the emergency scenario that we were given and the kind of emergency that was building up and eventually exploding, exploded in the financial markets, specifically with the repo market crash. Maybe I will talk a little bit about, about repo, repos, what they are and, and the role they have in the financial markets, which is huge. Okay. Um, but basically we had a crash, a financial crash in, sept in mid-September um, 2019, which um, created a situation whereby um, major investment funds, financial elites, and the Fed, the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of America, the American, the US Central Bank, um, you know, had to do something about it. And they, they basically had to do what we can call a kind of a, a QE, a quantitative easing exercise, uh, but on steroids, like a, a yeah. really huge injection of uh, liquidity um, to plug the liquidity trap, you know, to, to, to plug the, the, the holes in the, in, the, in the repo market. And to cut a long story short, basically in order to be able to do that, uh, safely, at least, um, they had to um, uh, freeze uh, the economy. They had to turn the uh, Main Street um, economy, the engine of Main Street, down, off completely, uh, because that was the only way in which they would have been able to um, to sort out the, 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 the repo market and, and, by extension, all the financial markets, because they're all connected, and you know, all you need is a little um, uh, a liquidity trap in a, in, a, in, a, in a key sector like the repo market um, to, to cause a domino effect of you know, know the others, yeah. which, which eventually would, would also obviously um, uh, concern Main Street, so the real economy. Um, so the deflagration would have been huge, mm -hmm. right? And the only way uh, to sort out that problem in the financial market uh, they knew that uh, beforehand was to find a way to, um, uh, uh, um, to shut down the real economy, right? To avoid contagion, um, economic yeah. contagions yeah. to reach the ground, and to reach Main Street and to cause problems such as hyperinflation, right? It's interesting how um, these entities, obviously we're talking about entities like um, uh, the Fed, of course, but also BlackRock, for example, mm -hmm. which is the biggest and most powerful and wealthiest uh, investment fund in the world, 
um, managing bonds and, 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 and stocks equivalent to 40, around 40% 40 of US GDP. So we're talking about incredible, yeah. a, an incredible player, very powerful, and, and it would be naive to think that uh, the BlackRock has no um, uh, uh, systemic uh, role, basically, in the system. Yeah, There's role within, within the system, the system and, and the decisions that are taken at a global level, right? So basically what, what happened was that, um, um, you know, interestingly, it's not as if the, the, repo, the repo market crash took them by surprise. They knew it beforehand. So if you look at August 2019, there's a series of documents that I've, that I've looked at, and not only me, but others as well, um, where uh, they basically say that uh, th this major downturn is going to happen. Um, you know, we're talking dealing about with the, dealing with the next downturn. I think it was. Yes, this, yeah. is, the, this, is, yeah. this is exactly the, the document produced, the white paper produced by BlackRock uh, in mid-August um, 2019, after the BIS, which is um, the Bank of International Settlements, the the central bank of all central bank, a very powerful. So if, there's, there's a nice book um, called uh, The Tower of Basel. Hmm. Oh, I heard about it. Not, not read it, but yeah. Yeah, which is um, it, it, very factual, but it tells you about the power of, of, of the Bank of International Settlements in, in coordinating the action of all other central banks. And, and, and they, they issue um, statements um, uh, on a regular basis where, you know, they, they coordinate uh, action. And in, 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 on the 9th of August, 2019, they issued a paper, a working paper, where they, um, they talked about this coming downturn and, and they urged um, the Fed um, to implement some emergency measures to, and they use this very interesting phrase to insulate the real economy, right? This is in the paper. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Find ways of insulating the real economy in order to safeguard it from the major operations that are necessary to sort out the financial system in relation to a crisis, a downturn that is building up. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's what we're talking about. And um, so that, that's before the repo market crash. They clearly knew it. They clearly knew it. I don't want to speculate further whether it was just knowledge or something else, but they knew that this was going to happen. And it was almost uh, inevitable after 11 years of uh, honeymoon, as it were, yeah. like of QE honeymoon, where, where basically central banks were creating money out of thin air um, to support an ailing economic system, um, an, an economic system that is increasingly unable to produce new Sur surplus value, uh, the increasing, increasingly unprofitable, and you know the answer to this lack of profitability of the real economy is to potentiate, uh, to power the financial system more and more because that's where where all the capitals are going, all the investments have been made. So that is the the key area that needs to be uh, kept under. That, that you know uh, under control and it needs to keep going and so you know after 11 years of artificial money virtual money being pumped into the system it was pretty obvious that sooner or later uh, a disaster was going to happen right and we're talking about 2008 on steroids I mean, this is really what we, we, what we were talking about so what we were what we were facing at the end of 2019 and then covid happened um, whether it was a coincidence or, or not, I, I'm not so sure. I, <laughs> I tend to doubt it. I tend to be skeptical that it was a, just a coincidence um, because that was what allowed for this um, monetary policy to be implemented on a regular basis, right? We're talking about trillions of dollars that have been injected into the financial system thanks to the economy uh, Main Street being switched off fundamentally. The so in other words, the perfect situation pre presented itself about That's three, right. four months after this repo uh, crash. The perfect situation to implement the plan they had come up with the month before in August was dealing with the next downturn. To exactly. inject 
all sorts of money. And also no, not many people, I, I definitely, I was quite into finance at the time and I do not remember hearing much about this repo uh, crash. So it was, it was really it's, 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 it's a, it's, um, it's a crucial sector of financial market. It's, it's called, um, it's, it's shorthand for repurchase um, um, agreement. It's a contract where um, banks and investment funds exchange loan, uh, investment funds loan money to banks essentially against a collateral. And the collateral is often a treasury, a treasury bond, yeah. right? So this is that exchange. Essentially, it's, it's, it's a short-term short -term, yeah. uh, uh, loans, basically. Loans, yeah. It's a system of short-term collateralized loans where investment banks um, get uh, very quick and cheap, very fast and cheap money overnight, mostly, right? The, these exchanges happen overnight. Um, and, and, and with the promise of, of buying back the collateral that they've given um, so, you know, it's, it, it, it works for banks to get cheap money and quick money to invest into other sectors of the market, particularly the derivatives, mm -hmm. which is a huge know, galaxy, yeah. as you know, where trillions of money are exchanged on a daily basis. Um, and, and, and if that goes, if something goes wrong there, then everything else, it's a domino effect that everything else just collapses until it reaches the cash points. You know? And the borrowing rate basically went to 10% overnight. Yes, the overnight. reason why it crashed is because, um, uh, again, in a matter of a few hours, it went from 2% to 10.5%, something yeah. incredible. So that caused panic and, uh, and consequently a liquidity trap. And, and that's where the, the Fed had to, um, to intervene and with, with, you know, with buying assets and therefore pumping, injecting huge amounts of money uh, into, the, into the system, obviously money that has been created with a few clicks of a mouse. Yes. Right? Yes. So that's the other point that it's not real money, it's virtual money that however serves a very specific purpose of, of continuing, of safeguarding the financial sector um, and driving financial assets up. And, and, and you know, of course, the financial industry was saved once again like in 2008, a different kind of bailout, but still some kind of similar situation where you want to save the financial sector, in this case, by going direct, as, yeah, as, going direct. That's as what John Piper was put it, and, and Catherine Austin Fitz and others. Um, basically, going direct means just giving money directly to, to, the, to the banks and, 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 you know, creating money and giving it them, and, and giving, it, giving it to them directly. Yeah. And that, that, that's the novelty, that's the kind of, the game, you know, the, the, the game that has been played. Um, and as I said, the interesting, uh, fascinating thing is that, that this was going on before COVID. You know, this was already happening before COVID. And then COVID really was the emergency situation, the ideal emergency situation to implement. All the these strategy. policies, unprecedented yeah. monetary. The monetary policies. policy and this sort of hyper stimulus as it were monetary policy, which is, um, which is fascinating because it tells you that there's a, there's a connection between the two types of emergencies, right? The crisis that we have in the economy and the uh, microbiological crisis, the virological crisis that we've, we've been facing for, for a year and a half. Yeah. Well, as you and, said, follow the money. So that always... Well, and, and, and it continues with the variants, right? So we had the perfect virus at the perfect time and now we have the perfect variant at the perfect time because the, the, the idea being that they can't all of a sudden open the tap. No. Um, since we live in a, in, a, in a debt economy, if we open the tap and you allow transactions, you allow, you allow money to circulate, all that money to circulate fast in the real economy, um, uh, you, know, for, you know, debt, et cetera, credit and so on, um, you end up with with runaway hyperinflation. And it, interestingly enough, some of these documents of the uh, BlackRock and, and the DIS, et cetera, really refer to explicitly to the danger of hyperinflation, the danger of uh, Weimar in, in, in the yeah. 20s, 1920s, or Argentina more recently, or, or, or Zimbabwe. So we get, we get a clear picture of what they knew what was going on, and, and they knew that extraordinary measures we're going to be, you know, have to be taken to stop, you know, prevent collapse from happening. And um, 
And then we can speculate further on how this happened, you know, the coordination of, of, of everything else. We can talk about them, you know. What, it's hard to start to establish a causality, like I direct, uh, you know, they planned everything. I don't think mm -hmm. it's ever that simple, but when you do start to look at things like event 201 and the language, I don't know if you actually looked at some of the clips. I've, there's, there's four segments in that event 201 and the third one, they specifically talk about information and stopping misinformation. And they, they have, there's even an American general like in the table, because it's a round table sort of simulation exercise with all his badges. And he, he specifically says that this is a great opportunity to collect information on the centers. I don't think he used the word the centers to be fair, but he, he says specifically on people that don't comply, on people that uh, spread misinformation. It's a great opportunity for ga data gathering, he says. Yeah. And that whole segment of uh, dealing with misinformation and uh, they talk about how to use uh, social media to direct people to the right information, which is precisely what we've seen with various platforms having their little COVID information centers where you can get the proper uh, government mandated uh, information at the end. So it's, it's quite fascinating. When you start looking at things like that, it's hard to ignore that kind of thing and, and to think it wasn't planned. Again, I don't think it was planned to the day to that kind of thing, but something and the way People like, I don't know if you know Peter Badazak of EcoHealth Alliance who was involved yeah. in the Wuhan lab. And he, he's, there's a clip from like 2016 about that we have a need for a pan coronavirus vaccine. We need to build up the hype and investors will follow, something like that. So again, alluding to the big pharma role in all of this. So, you know, I don't think, I don't know if we'll ever know, but it's certainly hard to ignore things like this and not kind of scratch your head. And... Yeah, yeah. I think, I think also the other, um, there's also this, this, this to say that we don't, we don't want to give them too much credit, right? I don't think <laughs> we are that clever, to put it simply. Um, they, th there, are, there are responses uh, to certain situations, uh, action, reaction situations. They, they, they don't, often don't go be beyond that, um, I don't think. So, so sometimes like conspiracy theorists give these people too much credit yeah, uh, I agree. as if they are this, you know, hyper intelligent, um, um, entity that can actually control absolutely everyone and everything. I don't think it's like that at yeah. all. But however, I think that they have planned a response, a reaction to a certain situation. And as you say, uh, event 201, Claydex a year before yeah. 2018, uh, there's a series of other documents that, that clearly speak about the danger of a pandemic and we know what Bill Gates said about it too. So there's a number of, I, I think systemically, and that's my point, really. My other point is that systemically capitalism, contemporary capitalism can only survive in conditions of emergency, which mm, that's allow the financial sector to thrive whilst also controlling uh, the situation down on the ground with real transactions and, 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 and people and the way in which people react to certain situations. So under the cover of a virus or of a major terrorist operation um, uh, and you know under the cover of some kind of emergency you can prolong the agonizing uh, life of contemporary capitalism which is really imploding in truth it's imploding simply because um, it's, it's less and less capable of, of producing wealth um, of creating surplus value out of labor which is the fundamental dialectic of, of 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 capitalism right and i think my my point is that it does so it, it is imploding because of an imminent reason so a systemic reason mm -hmm. and the systemic reason is fundamentally capital's alliance with technology with automation which is creating which is um which is uh, making it more and more difficult for capitals to, um, to have some kind of profitability in the real economy because, because labor, more and more labor is driven out without the possibility of being reabsorbed into the system. And, and, and of course, that, that is a major problem, not only for workers, but also for capitals. Um, because is this the moving know, contradiction that you refer to? It's the moving contradiction, yeah, yeah. really. Something that Marx uh, intuited and, and talked about with this notion of uh, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall 
uh, in capital, um, it, precisely in connection with the increase in what he calls constant capital, so machines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what he couldn't see, he couldn't foresee, is 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 this absolute fall in the mass of profit. We're really looking at an absolute fall because labor is less and less, as you know, has less and less of a role of a social function in the capitalist mm. um, dialectic, in the you know, in the in the capitalist ontology. And and therefore there's an there's, there's a situation of structural impasse. There's a situation of, imp, of ongoing implosion, stagnation in, in the real economy, uh, which means that capital is running away from the real economy and and, and, and investing more and more in the financial system. So the, the, the kind of potentiation of the, 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 what we call financialization of the economy is, I think, an answer, uh, a capitalist, the capitalist answer. Oh, I see. That's in interesting. In the real economy, right? Um, and, and so I think we, we, we must absolutely look at this situation in order not to make the mistake of saying, oh, it's only because some people want to get richer. Mm, yeah, like big pharma. Of course, th there are always going to be people who are going to um, make the most of the situation of a crisis. You never, never let a crisis go to waste. Go to waste. You know, yeah. crisis go to waste. And certainly, there are people, big tech, farm, big pharma, etc., making tons of money uh, out of this. But I think the wider, the wider um, context is more interesting, and the wider context speaks precisely of this, of this grinding to a halt of the capitalist economy that in order to survive its own implosion has to play this game that we see being played today, uh, which is a combination of keeping the financial system going, driving the assets up all the time, you know, inflating bubbles after bubbles, whilst at the same time keeping the situation down on the ground, the real people, the real workers under check, in some kind of check. Yeah. Because of course, uh, the two has to have to go together. Well, see, for an economic reason, inflation, yes, but also but also to prevent uh, rebellion, you know, rebellion, revolts, and, and organization of the workers and, and the people. Um, and we know that we know that um, propaganda is crucial in this, right? Propaganda is crucial in creating fear and and in keeping uh, populations in, in, in check, precisely, so that they. Um, they can become resilient yeah. to, <laughs> to the crisis and the, and, and the situation in which they find themselves. So would you say, basically, because I think the real finance of the fi financialization, am I saying that correctly, of the economy, I think it probably started in the 70s, 80s, I would say. I think, so, I think so, the big, yeah. so would you see that as a the sort of, not the first transformation of capitalism, but a transformation which has culminated now in the last few years to the, to the point that it can't go further until it undergoes another transformation, which is arguably kind of what we're seeing now happening in front of our eyes? I think so. I think this, the, the, the point where um, automation and the implementation of technology in production became, uh, became dangerous for capitalism, sort of, you know, past the point of no return in a way was in the eighties. That, that's where it started. Where, more people were being laid off than people being re more workers were being laid off than we as absorbed into the system. Of course, technology and automation have always been part of what capitalism does, you know, trying to keep costs of production down by, by using machines instead of human labor. But, but from the 80s onwards, I think that really exploded, especially with the, the acceleration, the incredible acceleration of technology. Yeah. Um, since then, and 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 uh, and that's that coincides with the um, with the financialization uh, of the yeah. economy, of course, as a kind of escape route. You know, it's a kind of forward escape, escape route to avoid facing implosion in the real economy. So the work society survives only thanks to finance. It was almost like, an, from their point of view, it's a necessary step. You know, it's unavoidable unless you implode. Like other work society have imploded, like 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 socialist um, work societies have imploded in the in the eighties, precisely in the eighties when all that was taking place. Capitalism didn't didn't implode because it was more flexible and it more resourceful in many ways, and it, it, it used the financial system as a way to um, to counteract 
that implosion. And I think we're still there now, even though obviously there's less and less time now because we are accelerating towards what we call the Great Reset, um, accelerating towards... Um, but so many people still think it's a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy. I'm like, go, yeah. go read, go, go look at the documents that they give us. I mean, it's incredible. The, that's, that's the easy answer, right? Conspiracy, conspiracy. Um, it's not enough to say conspiracy. There's something bigger than just a conspiracy, unfortunately. You know, it's this, the whole system. We are all within this uh, system that is unable to, is, is really imploding. And the only way it has to survive is by playing these games, which are in incredibly dangerous, more and more dangerous. You know, it's, it's a system based on, 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 on um, debt leveraged speculations. Yeah, you know, based on on the economy is, is a debt economy, and it depends on the speculations, trillions of of, of dollars, particularly, uh, but not only dollars, of course, um, that 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 are exchanged in in, in 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 the in the financial markets. That's what you know, the, you know where the traction comes from. Yeah, it's from there. Um, so if you don't understand that, right, then then you you end up with these conspiracy theories which um, are ridiculed and I think to an extent rightly so yeah, yeah. you need to look at the whole picture and yeah and and unfortunately this is what the left is unable to do paradoxically right the left particularly the radical left should have all the the, the tools mm, to, to do this to understand the wider picture but what I'm dismayed by is precisely the inability you know the kind of inability of, 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 of most of the left to, to understand this wider context. Um, maybe too much complicity with the system. Yes, in the last decades, certainly the moderate left has been complicit with the system, so they can't That's see. That's what it. my dad would say. My dad would say. <laughs> dad would say, dad would say. Um, as far as the radical left is concerned, maybe the radical left is too sort of fetishistically attached to a certain notion of revolution, a certain idea of social uh, conflict, which misses, I think, um, Marx's key point in relation to capitalism, which is the critique of political economy, right? Not so much Marxism as a revolutionary uh, theory, but what really matters in Marx is the critique of political economy, which is, um, which is based on understanding how it's bound to implode, right? It's bound to, uh, the crisis is bound to become terminal. Mm. And, and now we are at this terminal moment, I think. It's a very delicate moment because I think it, the risk is that we end up with a kind of totalitarian capitalism where you know, the privileges of the capitalists are safeguarded the power doesn't really change the power uh, relations, but what changes is the, the the kind of totalitarian conditions in which we have to live, right? So we end up from uh, we, we end up moving from a liberal democratic society where we think we have rights, um, rights to work, for example, um, participatory um, democracy, and all the rest of it with a society where these rights and these freedoms will be taken away from us because we need more and more to be um, kept uh, in, 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 in fear and in a, in, a, in a constant state of emergency. Because that's the only way in which capitalism can survive. So I think that ties in with the critique of political economy that we can see already in, in Marx. And I think it's um, the fundamental contribution of Marx is precisely this type of critique of political economy rather than all the rest that, as I said, often the radical left is fetishistically attached to. Yeah, it's very sad because... Yeah, it's very sad because... I'm hearing an echo. Is that... No? Okay, I think it's... it's okay with me. Um, today's left seems in many ways very superficial and concerned mm. with, uh, I think, what are important issues, but they really have failed, especially over this COVID crisis, to look at the deeper structural points that you raised, for example, in your essay. And just, it's, uh, I think also what was hijacked 
because I think part of what this great, this new, new, non new deal, this great reset, they, they've hijacked a lot of, I think, liberal leftist, uh, not liberal, but sort of the green uh, new deal, the green revolution. They've managed to hijack a lot of these concepts you have following to what happened with the great recession. You have all these banks taking up LGBT sort of uh, symbolism and acting as if they care about minorities. And I think partly it's worked. And that's what I'm seeing even across many of my friends. They, they really do not question much. And they, they know that there's been a massive wealth transfer over the past 18 months, but um, they, I don't know, it's, it's hard to get through to yeah. them. I managed a couple of times to have really good discussions with some of my friends, but it's really hard, I think. I don't know, I don't know what's happened. Well, I do kind of- I think It's a kind of ideological blackmail almost, you know, we, we give you all this, you know, civil rights, minorities, etc., the planet, um, and so on. Uh, but we hide from you all the rest that is going on. Yeah. Right? So you can get you can you can get passionate passionately attached to something that makes you feel better that maybe even um, deals with your sense of guilt, right? With uh, with, with with the greenwashing of, of the economy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But but you won't see you won't see the real things that matter. You know you you won't see uh, the way in which workers are uh, reduced to neo slaves. You know, in, in many uh, cases, you won't see that we're taking away your elementary freedoms, your elementary dignity as a, as a human being, for example, with the introduction of this uh, green passes in Europe, right, which is, you know, it's going to go ahead. They, they've read today that it will be implemented in Italy for the next year, at least for another year. And you know that once it's implemented, you won't go back. You know, once it's there, it's it's impossible to go back. It will become normal, normalized. Yeah. And the next step would be to to microchip it. You know, to to kind of microchip it under our skin, and and that makes it really work. That makes it really work properly. Just put a um, QR code on our forehead. Make it easier. Yeah. <laughs> how do you how do you go back to that? Once it's implemented, it's very 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 difficult um, to go back. And that's the kind of danger I'm talking about. You know. Um, and I think leftists, including Slavoj Žižek, unfortunately, they cannot really see that danger. Um, I've not really followed him much over the past. I know you wrote a book last year. What do you think of his uh, response overall? I've written a little piece on, on, on his response on, on the pandemic, and, but I criticize him. Okay. Um, for, for these reasons, more or less. So I think he misses, he misses the real point. It, what, what he says in the pandemic, uh, one and two, more or less, is that this is the this is the end of capitalism. You know, the the, the, the pandemic actually works against uh, the capitalist logic, and it will bring it down. And then we will have communism, right? This is <laughs> this is what he says. It's, you know, slightly over, but it's totally it totally misrepresents the situation. I don't think, what he doesn't get is that that COVID is saving capitalism in a way, right? Or capitalism is using COVID in order to prolong its lifespan. Um, it's not going to bring it down. It's not going to. It's not. It's not going to create this mass solidarity. At least not straight away. Yeah. We'll have to wait much longer to have some kind of sense of international solidarity. Fear and panic and so on will uh, stay with us. Yeah. You know. And I think they will. They will. They will play this game where they, they, they vary emergencies. A bit of COVID now. Then when the when the COVID bubble goes down a bit. You will get more terrorism, you know, for example, climate. international terrorism. I think climate is lining up. Yeah, lining itself you know, up. So they, they, will, they will mix uh, the kind of emergency scenario. And but but what won't change is is that we will we will fear as if we are in a we need biosecurity. Right? Yeah. We will we will, we will need a biosecurity state, uh, national security, uh, and we will accept unfortunately, most of these measures, uncritically, um, without putting up a, a resistance to it. And if you put up a resistance to it, you're immediately labeled like a neo-fascist, you know, or some kind of crazy lunatic. Um, and I think that's the problem, you know, that, that they are playing a game in a, you know, there's a lot of uh, behavioral psychologists oh, yeah. advising, advising the elites. Um, and they know how to how to how to create a psychological. Um, I thought what war. I was going to say earlier, 
they might not have everything figured out, but they do have the behavioral psychologists yeah. on their side. They have the That's right. They know that they can they they can organize these situations where you know they, 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 psychological warfare, as I said, they can control populations through manipulation, through propaganda, etc. I I don't think they will ever fully succeed, right? Because you know I don't believe as a dialectician, I I think there is always space for 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 rebellion and 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 and, and for organizing dissent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we'll never be 100% totalitarian, of course. That is impossible. But I'm kind of pessimistic for the for the near future because all the signs are saying that we need to stay in a state of emergency and and fear will, will need to be uh, implemented as it were. And population will need to be manipulated further uh, simply for you know for kind of empirical economic reasons. You know, if you think of, for example. The Fed. The, there's going to be the usual central bankers meeting in in, in um, Wyoming. Um, in, oh yeah, it should be it should be now in August. Yeah. Tomorrow, right? I think it starts well, tomorrow. Okay. Um, in Jackson Hole. Yeah. And and you know what 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 do you expect uh, Jerome Powell to say? You know, the chair of the of the Fed. What, what he, the only thing he can do, I think, is, is in really financial terms, is, is um, to kick the can, as you say, down right? In, I think down the road, right? Further. So you can only continue with this policy, uh, monetary policy, stimulus policy, whatever you want to call it, you know, creating money out of thin air. And it will, it, it will continue to happen because any even small increase in, in interest rates. At this stage, would cause massive deflagration. You cannot afford to increase interest rates, you know, the, the cost of money, because that will simply not work in the current conditions. So the only way that, that the system has to, to to survive is precisely by prolonging this this, this situation. Um, but obviously, you cannot prolong it eternally, right? Sooner or later, something will give. Um, there will be another crash soon. Yeah, probably very, very soon, probably in the debt market, you know, in the in the bond market, um, something that will be massive, huge, you know, kind of atomic explosion. And, 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 and then what next? Another emergency will be needed to to be able to, you know, to implement new measures. Just while we All restructure with... the whole global economy to stay in emergency. And yeah, yeah. And, and, and something else that we convince people that in order uh, for them to be saved and to be safe, more measures have to be introduced, right? And 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 it's not a matter of saying, oh, just we want to want to retain our freedoms. We, you know, it's not a libertarian argument. My, my argument, not a libertarian argument. I'm just saying that that this will end, and it's going to end. It's already going in a kind of totalitarian way, um, and 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 that only to save the interests of, of capitalism as a system, as, as an impersonal, blind mode of production, right? And, and mode of social reproduction. And also, of course, the privileges of those who are in power, which, which are the kind of un, uh, anthropomorphic manifestation of the capitalist relation, right? They are simply there to execute the capitalist logic fundamentally. Yeah. Um, well, what a situation. So the future doesn't look particularly good, the immediate future. And it's, in, a, in a way, it's better to be aware of that than not to be aware of that, right? That's my point. Because you need to be critically aware of it if you want to do something about it, rather than believing that, you know, they, they tell us all the time, oh, don't worry, next year will be over. You know, they told us last year, if you take the vaccines, you'll be okay, yeah, we'll go back to normal. We never want to be back to normal. You know, that there are going to be other variants or some kind of emergency that will permit the current um, uh, economic scenario. But that's, that's where it's also good to listen to what they're saying, because Klaus Schwab himself said, like literally states that this is a perfect opportunity to reimagine our world and to, and yeah. he, he quite literally states there's no going back to normal. You know, that, that's not going to happen. It's a, yeah, it's a some of them are actually, actually openly saying it, yeah. you know, and, um, and I, I'm not, I'm not um, I, you know, I think, I think there's also a kind of conflict between those who are in power. Some, yeah. some of them want to push for this uh, uh, um, 
you know, the, 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 the Schwab scenario, the Great Reset. Mm -hmm. uh, some others are a bit more tentative with it, right? Surely. And therefore, they kind of, um, they, they, they try to, to, to put obstacles and, and to put a span in the world. So it's, 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 it's a conflict. We, I think we should realize that it's a conflictual situation also among those in power. And that, that is where maybe we have a chance to intervene yeah. because there is, there's inconsistency in what they're doing. There's no real clarity of vision at all. There's no long-term clarity of vision. All, all they do is, is they are aware of the fact that they need to control populations more and more if they want to keep um, capitalism alive, you know, in, in its wider kind of ontological, uh, socio-ontological terms mm. um, as a system of reproduction and of and profit making. Um, um, but it's, it's not going to be easy for them to do it necessarily, also because they are conflicted and also because there are clashes um, 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 at, the top, know, at the top, so to speak. Yeah. Very interesting. So how, of course, you're a your university professor, which I'm sure must have been interesting over this past 18 months. And uh, without going into too much detail about you personally, but where do you see the future of sort of academics who perhaps don't agree so much with these narratives? And of course, maybe we can also talk about the role of universities in academia itself, not just throughout these 18 months, but also I mean, we don't have to get into that, but when I think of places like Imperial College London that have been so important in terms of providing all these mod these doomsday models, and you have a, a few other institutions that have really feels like they've been quite complicit and going along with all with what's been happening. So where do you see the future perhaps of dissenting professors and of academia broad, broad, more, more broadly speaking, sorry? Yes. Uh... It's, it's a very delicate subject because I'm, I'm part of it and I'm aware that, you know, um, censorship is, is widespread and it, it, I think it, it reaches every um, sector yeah. uh, of society. And so uh, it's difficult to talk about myself in academia, but I have to say that I guess when I, get in, when I got into academia, I, I was a, a little bit uh, under the illusion that the academia was different from what I then saw. Um, I wonder if critical, think is, critical thinking is still so crucial to academia, um, particularly in relation to these wider contextual issues, right? Um, I'm not so sure it is. I think academia in many ways is um, a hierarchical structure um, and um, academics tend to be, and I include myself in this, you know, slightly kind of inward looking, sort of private individuals that um, pay little attention maybe to these wider um, issues, you right? Uh, critical issues outside uh, academia. Or they do, of course, for their own research and obviously for their own careers, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, I, 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 to be completely honest, I don't have much hope in in you know um, academia producing the the amount of critical thinking that we need the critical awareness that we need today uh, if we want to get out of this very very difficult situation um, very dark situation you know very, very problematic situation and you know it's it's unfortunate it's it's a bit like with the left you know um, there's there isn't much desire to get, um, you know, to, to criticize the system as it is. Um, the danger is that you, you end up agreeing with people on the other side, um, with the right. And, and the right is a bit more, the right is a bit more open to, to, to criticize, a bit more willing to criticize the system for the wrong reasons, I think, right? Because they don't get the, the context themselves. But they see that there is manipulation going on, that there is propaganda, and so on and so forth. So um, the danger is, is that you end up with uh, with with bad fellows you don't want to be with, you know, at all. Yeah. Um, but th th this is part of 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 the the, the, the collapse of of the left. Um, what we were talking about earlier, um, the fact that the left has completely or almost completely given up 
um, critiquing um, the, the system as a system, as a mode of production and a mode of social reproduction, mm. right? Um, and one needs to understand that if one wants to criticize it. Um, one shouldn't personalize guilt. Right? That, that's also my point. Personalizing guilt is always bad. It always ends up badly. So when you start saying, oh, it's Big Pharma or it's uh, Bill Gates or it's somebody like that, um, you end up with tragedy most of the times in history, right? You don't, you, you, need to, you need to look at the systemic conditions and you need to look at, um, at, 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 at the system of social reproduction as a kind of impersonal machine that carries on regardless of who's at, at, you know, in the driving seat. You know, it could be Bill Gates, it could be Jerome Powell, it could be some, somebody else, but it will carry on. Um, because it's in us, right? Also, it's in everybody. It's the system that makes up who we are. So this, it's it, it's difficult to be critical, um, because you're involved in, in in what's going on yourself. You know, you're you're part of yeah. it. You're not outside. You're not outside looking in. You're inside a system that is slowly but surely imploding. Yeah, and that's the starting point. Otherwise, you end up with saying. Um, pointing your finger against the enemy, um, you know, the culprit, the one who's responsible for all the evil, for all the you know, disasters that we're going to see. And I think that's wrong. Yeah. So what have you, again, not, not to get uh, to talk too much on a personal level, but what, how do you see, because, you know, we've been talking about the system and um, what's been happening with finance, but are, are there any steps maybe that you've taken personally in your life to prepare for whatever is coming? Or do you have any solution, not solutions, okay, solutions is a big word, but do you have yeah. any <laughs> advice for people in terms of steps they can take in terms of preparing themselves, maybe becoming more independent? I've seen a lot of talk of counter economics, coming up with our own communities where we can have our own currency, maybe. Of course, that's very hard to do if you live in a city. For a lot of people, yeah. it's very hard. But do you have any ideas where what we might do to counter this at all? I, I don't think I, I have. I don't think there's a kind of shopping list that I can point to. So we could do this, this, and this. Yeah. Like if you buy, some people say you have to buy gold, you know, in, in economic terms, buy more and more gold to make sure that you are safe in case there is a massive devaluation of, of your... Um, of your money, the, you know, the, your savings in the bank, so on and so forth. Like this is on a very basic level, just to give yeah, you an yeah. example of what people are saying that you need to do in in relation to the coming um, um, let's call it. inflation, because inflation will continue to rise, right? In inflation, they say that it's that it's that it's um, that it's temporal, that is, um, but you know, they've been saying it for a while. It will continue to rise until probably there would be a crash in the, in the bond market. So there will be a major problem in, again soon in, in the financial system. So, but I don't think that I can, you know, I can follow any of, any of that. You know, I don't want to follow any of that. I think that there would be, you know, in, in a kind of, in a kind of proto-deterministic way, you know, that the system will produce antibodies almost, right? It will produce some kind of forms of resistance mm -hmm. and alternative um, um, ways of organizing your socio-economic and cultural life. I think they will they will emerge, and um, and they are maybe they are already emerging. You know, beyond yeah. my radar, there's only I'm sure they are there. There are, and I think, and I think um, they they will be um, tasked with um, uh, resisting uh, the current implosion, and um, and ideas will develop as they grow. Right, you cannot. I don't think you can before they actually happen. Already know what would need to be need to be done. You do, you don't know what needs needs to be done, but you know that there has to be that somebody say must be able to say no to this. This is the first step. Saying no to this and being critically aware of what's going on, impose some kind of critical resistance to this intellectual resistance, even on a, on a very elementary level, is the crucial step. Right, and it it really means understanding the context, understanding where this crisis comes from, and understanding that it's unfortunately it's not just a health emergency, there's much more behind it, is, I think, the first step to become aware of what's... Of what's. And then, 
I think forms of resistance and alternatives will emerge and God knows what might happen to them. I don't, I'm sure that even from a spiritual level, humanity will never give in completely, right? It yeah. Always, uh, that's what I'm going to say. Well, that's why we're here talking, right? Because, because we know that there is an energy and there is a spiritual dimension. I'm not talking about religiously or whatever, but uh, there is a, a, a form of innate uh, resistance inside a human being, even at the level of their own dignity, etc., that cannot be totalized, cannot be co-opted within a totalitarian system completely. And I think that's, that, that's going to emerge. Um, but it requires also a degree of intellectual awareness, resistance to propaganda, resistance to all this bombardment, you know, media bombardment. This is the thing that disgusts me the more, the most, you know, the kind of almost the pro intellectual prostitution of, of the media and the way they've been bought and they are con constantly bombarding us um, with uh, fear, uh, creating emergencies with a situation that, of course, could have been dealt with in a different way. Um, I'm not, of course, there's a SARS virus around, but um, but we've we've done the best we could to turn into an emergency, as it were, right? The system, <laughs> the best we could. Good way to emergency. We know very well what happened in Italy. I've I've, I've I've been I've been looking very closely at the situation in in, in Britain and Italy. You just you know you just look at the PCR test, the, the kind of fraudulent uh, uh, thing that it that it that it is, and uh, the way it's been been created in a hurry, um, the way it regulates. All documented, um, all information. The stats, it's all, it's, all, it's all a lie in that way, right? All a lie and it's all done to create fear and, and to create emergency. Some people, most people are buying it, I think, in, in, in good faith. They, they, they're not necessarily, you know, um, aware. Um, but exactly, you need to be aware. You need to be aware that, that this is part of a, of a bigger script, of another script. It's part of another agenda, um, and emergencies are today, but always part of a different agenda. Yeah, I think that's where critical awareness needs to come from. Oh, what a situation! It's fascinating to think, and I, I, I find myself. I live with my girlfriend here in Edinburgh. It's maybe not every day, but at least a few times a week, we we look at each other and we're like, we're living through historical times, literally. Yeah. That's within eighteen right. months we've um, like this the feeling keeps sinking in more and more that like something as you said there's, either there's going to be a crash in the next few months or maybe next year you don't know how long they can prolong it it's it just feels like something so i mean something has already happened unprecedented that we already know over the past 18 months but it's just hard to shake this feeling that you're just watching no, history well, before you yeah you see you see like when i'm in an airport and you are refused a coffee or to sit down for a coffee in an airport because you don't have the green pass. You, you don't have the, 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 the health, the vaccine passport fundamentally, right? You don't have it and therefore you can't sit together with other people and, and eat a sandwich or drink a coffee. You've got to stand up next to them in the same space, uh, not outside necessarily, in the same space, so sharing the same air, breathing the same air, same space, but you have to stand up. So you, you then you feel it on, on, on your own body. You know, you feel the discrimination that is taking place and how that discrimination can easily become normal. Um, you know, and uh, I had the same experience lately, recently, I went to get a coffee and um, I, it was in my own right actually to have a coffee standing, you know, quick coffee standing by the bar. They told me I had to go outside um, to drink my coffee because I didn't have my green pass. Um, and I said, look, unfortunately, the law says that I can have a quick coffee without sitting down inside. But they were so scared. They said, oh, the police has been checking, um, you know, it's coming this morning to, to check on, on, on us. And unfortunately, you need to go somewhere else. And you think, what's going on? It, it, defies, it defies the most elementary logical yeah. structures that they told us when we were kids, you know? So, so a lot of these measures just defy logic. They're beyond elementary logic, and you think people need to to wake up, you know, to, to yeah. To, to, there's something. It's a fascinating. Here. I think I read about this. I don't know if it was the Soviets 
some kind of 20th century communist. And one of their strategies in terms of propaganda was to make people do ridiculous things almost. So that it's, it's like you, lo- you feel weak when you do it, when you comply with. Yeah. That's why since April, I had a week in, towards the end of April, I was like, I'm going to prepare myself for this week. At the end of this week, I'm going to stop wearing a mask in the supermarkets. That's what I told myself. It took, took me a week to still wearing a mask. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to practice, go every day with a mask, but I'm going to think, you know, next week, this day, I'm not going to do it. I did it, and I haven't been wearing one in supermarkets. Okay, in other places, restaurants, because it's hard, because there's different yeah. contexts. In supermarkets, you know, you're probably not going to get asked. But in a restaurant, there's more people looking. It's just different. So, but that's why it's difficult. One, yeah. Yeah, we internalize also these fears and these structures, of course, right? Yeah. So we become, we, we, we are affected by that. We, we don't want to take the mask off in certain places, even we know that it's totally pointless to wear a mask because of scientific reasons, right? Or, or things like that. Um, and yet we, we are, we over-identify with the, 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 the lies that we're told. We, had, we, we internalize them and then, and then we, become, we become part of the kind of manipulated mass and it takes a massive effort to, to and then you realize that once these measures are in you don't go back you know there's that famous piece by uh, Aldous Huxley uh, talking about scientific totalitarianism right it says something like um, with a political type of totalitarianism you, you've got a chance of coming out of it sooner or later it will fall you know you'll be right but with when it comes to scientific type of totalitarianism, so on based on scientific grounds, like today's kind of scientific emergency, you know, yeah. kind of bio- biological emergency, whatever, it's it's incredibly difficult to come back, you know, to escape it, because you know it, it's really our bodies that are uh, involved in a kind of biopolitical way, and I'm I, I'm not. Uh, particularly keen on biopolitics, but there is a biopolitical dimension to this, clearly, clearly. obviously. It's really about, uh, a, you know, a kind of psycho, physical uh, a cage where we're put, and it's, it will be more and more difficult to get out of it. You know, with the green pass and health passport is very clear that once you have it, you know, initially it was supposed to be two months, now it's already a year in Italy. Um, and then after that, it would be normal, and, and God knows what next. So, yeah, there needs to be resistance now to that, basically. That's, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Well, I guess that's what we're trying to do with these discussions and the little ways yeah. which we, you know, I've just told you not wearing a mask in a supermarket, which many people yeah. hear and be like, ah, oh, you know, who do you think you are? But, you know, that's a way that honestly I feel a bit empowered at least to be, and I've not, I've no issue. No one has asked me ever since April. Uh, oh, weren't you wearing them? Actually, once there was there what they put a guard at Sainsbury once. I don't know why he was there, and he asked me why weren't you wearing a mask? It was like a medical exemption, no problem. So it's yeah. one little one, one little way that I feel a bit. I've, I've had a few incidents like that. I don't want to necessarily talk about it, but yeah, I've experienced uh, this kind of aggressive behavior from others for not complying with certain things, you know, um, and. And I don't try to provoke things like that at all. Oh, yeah. But sometimes, sometimes almost without realizing, I enter a, a place without a mask on because it's not natural for me to put a mask on. And <laughs> I've, I've had a few, yeah, encounters. Yeah. And is your university, is your university implementing any of these measures so far, or are they? My university has implemented the mask mandate. At the beginning, you know, you have to enter the university with the mask on, and then. Um, the premises with the mask on and then obviously when you're in your office you can do what you want but like for example we are um i'm told that i'm going to be teaching virtually for all of this semester really um even though i don't think personally the that there's need for that right i mean the population has been vaccinated um it's supposed to be but of course cases are up right the variant is, is working and we know why the variant is working right this is exactly what we talked about so far the variant is almost like a monetary tool it, it serves a certain monetary purpose uh, financial purpose um but yeah no, the university goes along goes along with these things and i i don't know what will happen next um i'm hopeful that we can go back to some kind of normality at least in teaching 
I, I love to be able to go back to the classroom to teach, but I know that for another semester, yet another semester, at least I will be teaching virtually, which wow. is for me great shame, right? But uh, some classes will go back, the smaller classes, but large classes won't go back. And um, that's uh, something that, yeah, I'm not particularly keen but on, but. Oh, all right. Well, I think we've, we've, we've had a really good discussion. It's been about an hour, five minutes, okay. I think, and it's been, it's gone pretty fast, I think. And uh, I don't know if there's anything else. I, I didn't have more specific questions. Uh, if I if I sat down for five minutes, I could probably think of many more questions. But I think we've kind of no. addressed the core issues, the financial picture, the socioeconomic picture, and the kind of state of capitalism. Yeah. And, uh, you know, academia the left so i think it's been a really really productive uh, discussion and i wanted to thank you thank again you. so much for coming on and uh, i'll be following from a distance we've come up more essays and on what's happening and uh, maybe we can do it again in the next few months maybe in Absolutely. three four whenever, months whenever, we'll, we'll whenever see you wish we can talk about like ad hoc um, problems as well certain specific issues there's a lot to be said and a lot of information to be you know, to be shared about yeah. what's going on. I think counter counter information is important um, against the, the kind of propaganda that we're seeing. Um, so if we can organize, we could organize something on specific issues as well, if you wanted to. Yeah, I think this, lovely. Like, obviously, I'm, I've been researching this for a year and a half, nonstop. Um, it's something that you, I, I can't avoid doing simply because it's, as you say, it's a historical, it's a kind of paradigm shift that we're going through, right? It's a real it's a kind of real event. Um, and we can't just ignore it, you know? We can't just ignore it and think, thinking that everything will go, will go back to normal. It won't go back to normal unless we do something about it. Yeah. I tried for a month of ignoring, because I started learning about this probably in May of last year when I started this website and the podcast came later, but I tried for a month because I just was out of university. I was looking for work. So I was like, okay, let me just job hunt. I'm not going to worry on what's happening with this yeah. great reset stuff and all that. But I just couldn't. It feels like almost like I have a responsibility to myself and my girlfriend, who at the beginning until February was calling me a conspiracy theorist and now is even more interested in everything that's <laughs> happening. So, you know that. <laughs> but, but, so when I say going back to normal, I don't, I don't, obviously, I don't mean normal as in, haha, we're all happy. The problem was already there yeah. in in normal right it's not something that is building up in what we would consider to be normal yeah. so i just wanted to say that in case because yeah 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 normal. it's not like it was all yeah. fine and that that before, before, yeah. normal misinterpretation of what reality is really but yeah i'm really great great to um to talk to you and, and to get to know you i'm really really pleased that we can exchange this these ideas it's it's very difficult even in academia to to find ways of exchanging um, yeah well i hope people. maybe we find some more colleagues or students that are also sort of thinking well, there, are exceptions, of course. There, are, there are exceptions that i you know I'm very keen on talking to people like in, in academia that i'm very happy to talk to but overall this kind of almost like a scared type of silence yeah. you know people are scared of of saying or or, or even of reading the signs that are clearly out there uh, but so yeah, the more we can talk, the better, definitely. The more we can spread, the more we can discuss things critically. Wonderful. Fabio, thank you so thank much. You. And I'll, uh, hopefully I'll speak to you soon. Eh? Have a good rest of your week. Take care. Cheers. Ciao.